Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining me today on the Yasmin Muhammad podcast. My very special guest today is Colin. Colin, um, you know what? Just I will let you introduce yourself rather than I introduce you. Um, I did give a brief bio on the website, but I want you to just um, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you see yourself and how you want to identify yourself to the audience. Sure, sure. Uh, first, thanks so much for having me on here. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you, especially knowing the work you've been doing. Um, so for me, um, I am uh, born and raised here in Alberta on the farm. <laughs> um, I uh, was just recently, I'm a lawyer, uh, was recently the, for two months, the chief of the Alberta Human Rights Commission and Tribunals until I was terminated uh, due to allegations of Islamophobia and racism. Um, my background is I attended University of Alberta for four years, uh, got a political philosophy degree, uh, spent two years at Harvard where I obtained a master of theological studies degree. Um, much of what I studied at the time was medieval Jewish, Islamic and Christian political philosophy. Uh, so that includes the Falasifa, uh, from the Islamic side, especially Farabi, uh, Avicenna, Averroes. And um, I then spent two more years at Boston College doing a PhD. I didn't finish it, unfortunately, because my advisor had a stroke <laughs> and um, <laughs> couldn't remember who I was. So I um, oh, moved over to Europe. I was able to get a job in Europe at the United Nations International Telecommunication Union. I spent two years there, then spent almost three years at the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, writing about, uh, I was part of the fundraising team, and uh, we did a lot of work uh, getting money from the uh, European Commission Humanitarian Office called ECHO, and uh, it would be used for various uh, work that the I ICRC uh, was doing out in the field, and my job was to basically write the reports. Uh, after we got the money to tell the ECHO what we were doing with their money. And that involved reports on a number of uh, areas where we were working. Uh, many of them did include uh, beneficiaries who were uh, from the Muslim faith. Uh, one of the things, of course, that became uh, significant was that you know, because Islam is quite extended over the world and it does interact with various other religions on its frontiers, a lot of times those reactions, whether for good or ill, were um, there, there was, there were clashes. Um, sometimes they'd be initiated by both sides, sometimes by the Muslims, sometimes the Muslims were victims, as often was the case. So we, what our work was, was to get money to assist these people. Uh, and they were internally displaced people. They weren't refugees, they were displaced within their own borders. So uh, that included everything from Palestine and Israel to Kashmir to Sudan to um, uh, we had Bosnia uh, we were working in. So that was my job there. After I did that for three years, then I went off to Paris and studied for the Diplôme d'études approfondies. And um, that's sort of a master's kind of beginning PhD program. And a lot of what I studied there was the history of the political form, uh, especially transformed, transformations from city state to empire to nation state, especially in the West. And I also studied with Dominique Schnapper, who was the daughter of well-known French intellectual Raymond Aron. And uh, under her, I studied integration of communities, immigrant communities into French and British society, uh, contrasting the two approaches. Uh, so, and often that did include looking at Muslim communities, especially uh, in France, uh, where there were some clashes, as well as how uh, it was impacting the Jewish community uh, in, in uh, France and the UK. Eventually, though, I, I finished that, came back to Canada. Um, I got my law degree, Dalhousie, in uh, 2009, and I've been a lawyer since then. Uh, I've served on various committees. I was a member of the Judicial Advisory Committee. Uh, so... The committee that recommends who should and shouldn't be uh, a, ju a justice at the, in the federal courts here in Alberta. I served on a couple of law society committees, and I've also done numerous academic writings. I've done, I often do book reviews uh, in areas that I'm somewhat trained in. Um, and I did a book review on uh, Ephraim Karsh's book, Islamic Imperialism and History. Uh, Karsh, of course, is one of the 
most preeminent uh, historians uh, of the Middle East, modern Middle East. And he is somewhat controversial, but um, find me a historian of the modern Middle East that isn't controversial. Uh, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a controversial subject. So uh, positions that are taken by academics can, if they percolate down into the political realm, become uh, a bit contentious. And that's what happened to me. Um, I had written a book review in 2009. And in 2022, uh, you know, 13 years later, that book review was uncovered. Uh, it was misrepresented. Uh, parts of it, you know, selective parts were taken out. Other parts were ignored. And I was accused of being Islamophobic and racist. Um, a blogger wrote an article about it. It wasn't very prominent in the mainstream media, but a blogger wrote an article about it. The opposition party here in Alberta, the New Democratic Party, the NDP, uh, decided to pick up on that and they called for my resignation and again accused me of being Islamophobic, racist, and have, of having written hate speech. Uh, there was an effort by their allies to deny that it was an academic book review, uh, though it clearly was. Um, so a lot of things were used against me to try to bring me down. Initially, it didn't get a lot of coverage, but eventually then the National Council of Canadian Muslims became involved and uh, they, uh, at, I met with them a few times, but eventually they sent a letter to the Minister of Justice here in Alberta uh, and asked for my resignation and he gave it to them without any you know, hearing, without any tribunal hearing, without me having an opportunity to defend myself. So... There's so many things. I'm really glad that I gave you an opportunity to introduce yourself because you had included so many more details that I wasn't aware of. Obviously, you have an extensive both, you know, academic as well as experiential background working with Muslim people and also the theology and the history of Islam, studying the, the history and theology of Islam. Um, so when you wrote this book review, which is, again, written by an academic it was a, the 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 book was about the history of Islam or something to do some sort of historical book, right? right. And so yeah. it was very clearly um, it, it, history is always going to be controversial as well because none you know we're always going to be looking at it from our own perspective and our own lens. But can you tell me what was it that the National Council of Canadian Muslims picked out out of your book review? that they felt that this was something that you needed to lose your job over, over this 13 year old book review. Sure. Well, there was a couple of things um, introducing the book. And of course, you know, you kind of look when you introduce something or writing, you look for something to catch people with. So I pointed out, and this was very much connected to my experience with the Red Cross was that at the time, Islam was coming into a lot of conflicts with religions on its borders and still is you know as i said christianity in bosnia uh you have uh conflicts in kashmir uh Nigeria. conflicts with yeah, rohingya yeah it, it, you know it's it's with it Buddhist, on on. uh hindus mm -hmm. i mean it's it, it and which is not really a surprising thing that was sort of the point of the book and the book review is islam came of an a of age in a time when uh sort of multi-civilizational empires like Persia, Macedonia, Rome, that sort of thing, Byzantines were common. That was the common political form. So it tended to take on the political form of, of an empire. Um, and certainly as it came following the prophet's death and it came uh, out of uh, Arabia, it took on a, an imperial format. And that's the caliph is, you know, the caliphate is, more or less an imperial type of form. It's not a city state, it's not a nation state, it's it's an empire. So I had said, you know, this is what's happening. And of course you have to remember too, at the time, it was very uh, common for academics to be discussing, can Islam interact with or become democratic? Does liberal democracy and Islam, uh, can you can they work together? So that was a very big theme at the time. It's not so much now. It's it's that sort of passed away, especially after the Arab Spring. But uh, at the time, that was a, a common theme, and it was an important theme because people were looking for a way, not just you know out of fear of, uh, of Islam in the West, but 
are looking for a way to improve the political situation for Muslims in Muslim majority countries. Uh, how to improve the situation for women, for minorities. I myself uh, am an openly gay man. So of course that's, a, that's an area of interest for me. Um, and it's, it's not to be, you know, condemning Islam or anything. And of course, one of the lines I put in, which was sort of a quick summary of Karsh's work, was to say that Islam has been one of the most militaristic religions that we've known. Um, and as I say, that that comes in, that, that makes perfect sense historically, because it came of an age in, in imperial situations. So Colin, I'm just going to stop you right yeah. now because these you don't even need to add any caveats to, to that. As somebody who was born and raised in a Muslim family, mm -hmm. lived in Muslim societies, that is something that Muslims are proud of. That is something that we are taught about all the time as children, how many battles there were, how, how far and wide Islam spread, how quickly it spread. The fact that it is a, a militaristic, politically based ideology because the religion part of it is is almost um a back seat to the fact that it's it's more of an ideology a political ideology um these are not nothing that you have said is in any way controversial or anything different than what your average muslim person would say and agree with as mm -hmm. well so i'm finding it surprising that they can write a letter that they are so powerful that they can write a letter and state that what you have said is so egregious that it can be considered Islamophobic, that, that fake word that has no definition, that can it, it's so nebulous, it can just be used to bludgeon whoever you want to bludgeon with it, um, mm -hmm. that they hold so much power that they can just write a letter and you lose your job without any sort of investigation, without any sort of opportunity for you to bring forth your experiences and your education. You had the author of the book himself write a letter um, supporting you and supporting the book review. In fact, you said he hadn't even read the book review before this whole thing blew no, up. No. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that they would unearth a 13-year-old book review as well, that is clearly you know, uh, that that's the that's the act of somebody who is trying to look for something like trying really hard, digging mm -hmm. really deep. It's it's nefarious. Yeah. Um, so how how was it that they could do this? How is it possible that somebody in your position can just lose their job so quickly without any kind of investigation, without any kind of tribunal? Is that is that how things work in Canada? Well, apparently it is. Obviously, it is in my case, um, and it shouldn't be. And now, one of the things that I've pointed out is that the the one I didn't make a robust defense of myself at the time because being chief of the commission, I'm chief of tribunals, so I have to be able to be seen as being objective and neutral and not taking sides. Um, and part of that, it, it's similar to being a judge or a justice. And uh, part of that is that you, you don't defend yourself publicly when you're attacked. Um, it becomes because that's seen as being opening you up to being biased. And especially in a case like this, where I've got um, a Muslim whole community that is sensitive to what's been done, what's been said. I come from an equity seeking group as a gay man. Um, so it was very difficult for me to defend myself. And usually if you have, but if you look at judges, if there's an accusation like this made against judges and there have been, um, they, that accusation will go to the, what's called the judicial council and they're able to make a defense there right now. Uh, Russ Brown, who's a justice of the Supreme court of Canada is uh, he's uh, sort of suspended from uh, working uh, because of some accusations that uh, some events that happened in Arizona, but he gets to make a defense. He has mm -hmm. lawyers. They make a defense for him in front of this judicial council. I was basically in a situation where the accusations were made. The opposition NDP jumped all over this. 
um, the blogger communicated with the National Council of Canadian Muslims to get them involved. And they sort of took on this role of arbiter of all things Muslim. So they assumed the role that they would speak on behalf of the Muslim community with me. And I met with them a couple times. And, you know, even that was discouraging. Um, it's been discouraging given my identity because it came to light that one of the individuals that I was meeting with uh, had himself in 2009, <laughs> the exact same year I wrote the book review, he had made statements uh, online uh, that were captured. He, he tried to remove them when he became head of the National Council of Canadian Muslims, but they were captured by an organization out of New York City, and he equated homosexuality to adultery. Mm -hmm. to taking insane amounts of interest. So I was, you know, I'm, I was put in a position to meet with an individual heading an organization who, and I understand those, you know, homosexuality generally is considered haram in Islam, but it, it, you know, when I'm in that position and having to meet with people who view my existence as somehow nothing more than a sin, it became very problematic for me to move forward and of course, an apology was demanded and I wouldn't give one. I made a statement, but I wouldn't give an apology. And that in itself was then turned against me. Um, and I, as it, time went on, I did uh, file notices of defamation against a couple of these bloggers, who is, and which is a normal part of the process once you've been defamed, is that you have to do that within three months of the defamation uh, with journalists. And I was also told that, you know, I, I had agreed I would meet with leaders in the Muslim community. Yet the, the National Council of Canadian didn't, Muslims didn't realize that I had met with some other representatives of Muslim, including an Ismaili uh, Muslim woman, who had actually told me I shouldn't be meeting with these people. Mm -hmm. uh, and another individual who's Muslim told me that because of my sexual orientation, I will automatically be considered uh, problematic and it will Immoral. not go well. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I still, I had never said that I wouldn't meet with community and I'm still open to doing it. I still think there's got to be some space for uh, some dialogue between Muslims and, you know, somebody with, uh, of my orientation. And, uh, but that's, yeah, that's how it happened. And eventually because I, I, they decided the the National Council of Canadian Muslims spoke with me. They were looking to set up some meetings. I said at first the one, the dates they had given me wouldn't work because I was, I have had other work going on and they then just decided that they would not facilitate it. And they then went to the Muslim community, uh, went to a number of mosques and some other groups. Uh, many of them are actually duplicates. So they, they're not unique uh, organizations and wrote a letter to the minister of justice. And uh, I was asked, well, what's your response to this? But of course I wasn't given the opportunity to have legal counsel or make a fulsome response or get, you know, Ephraim Karsh's statement about my book review. And I was fired. And it was actually in the media. I was told, the media was told that I'd been asked to resign and I hadn't formally been asked to resign. That came oh the next day. Oh my goodness. Wow. So that to me just sounds like pure wrongful dismissal. Am I wrong in that? Well, <laughs> um, you know, that's what we've argued. I have a lawsuit um, that I've we filed. Uh, my lawyer, Catherine Marshall of Toronto, has filed the lawsuit claiming wrongful dismissal. Um, and, you know, because we are in litigation, I can't say too much, but I'm hopeful. Uh, you know, uh, that happened under the Jason Kenney government, a previous uh, conservative government here in Alberta. We now have a new premier, Danielle Smith, and a new justice minister, Mickey Amory, who himself is from the Muslim community. Uh, who I understand. I've never met met the man, but I think everything I've heard about him is good. Um, and I, th I hope that's an opportunity for some reconciliation on this, you know, to show that I'm not hostile to that community in any way and that we can resolve these matters uh, in a beneficial way for all communities. Because I don't I don't want the Muslim community to feel alienated or that they don't or, you know, belong to in Canadian society. And uh, I think it's, it's an opportunity to try to reach out. So I just want to talk a little bit about the National Council of Canadian Muslims. They are an Islamist organization, an Islamist group. 
Um, they do not represent all the Muslims in Canada the way they pretend to. Um, so they are really the most fundamentalist of Muslims and their views are quite extreme compared to how your average Muslim might view the world around them. So the way that they represent themselves as supposedly being the, you know, speaking for all of the Muslim community is completely false. But it seems that it's accepted that way. People, you know, when the conservative government got this letter from them and their clones saying whatever it was that they were saying, they just took it as truth that they really were representing the Muslim community. And that's why having some sort of investigation would have been really important because it would have given you the opportunity to bring Muslims from other parts of the spectrum, not just fundamentalist Muslims, not just Islamists, to come and speak on your behalf, to come and speak their, their view and their perspective. I really do feel that you were so robbed and I and I'm I'm actually quite, you know, frustrated because I'm not I'm not understanding how this could even happen. Um I I know so we we haven't talked a lot of our viewers are not um Canadian. So I just want to talk a little bit about our our governments and and what that means. Um, I, I try to explain to people that Canada doesn't have a right wing. We just have <laughs> variations of left wing. Um, but the NDP, who are the National Democratic Party, who are basically close to the, the, the farthest left possible group that we have, um, they are the ones that were gunning for your job, basically. Um, they were the opposition at the time. And I am not surprised that the NCCM, I mean, I kind of am surprised that they went through so much trouble to dig up a, a 13 year old book mm -hmm. review, but I'm not surprised that they demanded an apology from you. They, that's, that's what they do, right? As long as you get down on your mm -hmm. knees and apologize and remember who you are, um, then they, they will, they will forgive you. Mm -hmm. um, but what does surprise me is how easily the conservative government capitulated to these bullies. That's that's what's really frustrating to me is, mm -hmm. I mean, it's different because this kind of thing happens to average people all the time. But you are not an average person. You are not in an average position. So whereas so many of us feel like we have no power um, it, it, it's really disheartening for me to realize too that even those of us who are are in positions of power, um, even you can be bludgeoned with this Islamophobia mm -hmm. term and then immediately lose your job without any kind of discussion or any kind of investigation. Like I'm, I know I keep harping on that, but I just can't get over it. Like mm -hmm. I'm really frustrated. I really need, I need an answer. I need to know how this could possibly happen. But I guess well, I'm not know, gonna get that answer today. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think there is something, there's there's maybe a bit of an answer I can give to that um, because there's one th element of this was the accusation of Islamophobia and racism and hate speech. But there's a lot more behind this. As one former judge has said to me, wheels within wheels. Um, there were other motivations involved, um, specifically what seems to be coming out now and has become uh, news through the reporting of uh, CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, has done a story on my predecessor at the Human Rights Commission, who was the full-time chief. Uh, there was an inter interim one chief between us, and then I became the next full-time chief. But what has been discovered and what I learned when I in those two months when I was chief backs this up, is this, this individual, when I won't say his name, um, he was hired in Alberta by the New Democratic Party. He was brought from Ontario. He was uh, given the job of chief. He uh, was paid at the highest end of the pay grade even though he'd never worked in Alberta with the government before and was given a very lucrative contract, including severance. Uh, and as it turns out, 
three years into a five-year contract, he suddenly left and we didn't really know why. And I was, I was a part-time commissioner at the Human Rights Commission for three years. So I had been, knew he was there. I was working with the legal counsel. Um, and eventually this fellow, he left in 2012, 2022, which of course led to the uh, competition uh, for, for replace, to replace him. And what has happened is he then went to Ottawa and, and became part, worked with the Canadian Human Rights Commission in Ottawa, in the capital of Canada. And he is now being investigated for abusing his staff. These are the same allegations that I heard, uh, including issues, not that he did this, but that he failed to deal with sexual harassment by staff of other staff at the Human Rights Commission in Alberta, and that there were, that he was abusive with management. Um, and that the government was looking to terminate him, but couldn't because of the lucrative uh, severance that the NDP had given him when they were in power. Mm. So what seems to have happened, and this is something, uh, these are documents that I've been provided by the government to suggest that um, staff at the, at the commission who were seeking to protect this individual uh, were leaking facts about uh, the uh, interview process, the recruitment process that I was going through to the NDP. And that the NDP most likely had a copy and so they wanted to protect him as well. So they decided the best thing to do was to prevent me from ever getting into the job to find out what had been going on and to allow somebody else in the job who wouldn't do the digging. And they knew I would. would cover for them. Yeah. Mm. The unfortunate side of this too is that, and is that the NDP know me well. The leader of the NDP, Rachel Notley, former premier, has been in my home. We did, my partner worked for her, directly with her, very closely, uh, for, well, four years uh, in a government role. Well, part of that in a government role, and then part of it as the, the NDP actually hired him in a political role. And so they knew us well. They've had fundraisers in my home, the NDP. They, I have gone for a birthday dinner with, uh, Irfan Sabir, who is the MLA, who explicitly called me Islamophobic and racist and called for my termination and actually called Ephraim Karsh's book Islamophobic, which is wow. just, you know, that nobody has ever called it that. That's just an amazing accusation against him. Um, so it was shocking. It was personally uh, offensive to us that the NDP did this. And as it started to come out the night this in, this this information was coming out and the attack was beginning against me, numerous new Democrats reached out to us and said, this is wrong. They reached out to their own executive. And apparently the NDP did pull back quite a bit, but Irfan Sabir uh, went ahead with the attack and repeated that attack through the, through the next few months. Um, so it, the, what appears to have been the motivation or one of the main motivations, there's probably more than one, was to protect the NDP appointment at the commission, my predecessor, who had all these issues of abusing staff and failing to deal with sexual harassment. And of course, in the two months that I was in the job, I immediately attempted to bring in an outside firm to do workplace review and look at all mm -hmm. of these things. And of course, with my termination, that, as far as I know, ended. ended. That mm -hmm. didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So what I was trying to do was give voice to these people who had been harmed at the commission. And in doing so, uh, my voice was taken away by uh, the NDP, by uh, the NCCM. And, uh, and I sometimes have the impression <laughs> that actually maybe the NCCM was really being used by the NDP mm -hmm. government because they were contacted by. And I think what had happened is the NDP had dug up this book review years ago. They had mm -hmm. it for quite a while. That's what I'm, I've been told. And then they gave it to this blogger. He then went to the NCCM and uh, that was the, the story. So in a certain respect, the whole Islamophobia element is just tangential to this. Mm -hmm. But it was it was a like you say, it was a club they could use against me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it wasn't really anything to having to do with Muslims at all, but with mm -hmm. protecting an appointee who seems to have had some issues um and yet it, it, you know it, it's pretty sad i think that that was done you know and in, in concerning the issue of having a tribunal or somebody investigate what had happened 
In fact, there was uh, Rajan Sani, who's a cabinet minister in the UCP government, in the conservative government, was hostile. You know, she thought I shouldn't have been in the job. She was, for various reasons too, she had her own motivations. But at least she did say there should be an investigation into how I was chosen and that sort of thing. Also, the anti-racism uh, council here in Alberta were not happy, but they said there should be an investigation. Well, so there were calls for an investigation. And I would have been happy to at least have had the opportunity to respond. I could have gone to Ephraim Karsh and gotten his uh, perspective on this. Uh, other academics have written in favor of, of my position. But that didn't happen. Um, I wasn't given that opportunity. Um, now, certainly, political considerations pop up for any government. But I think, um, and even an NDP candidate, <laughs> there was an NDP candidate, because we just had an election here in Alberta, a provincial election. And he's also a prof law prof, was going after the appointments process. Well, my vetting process was actually quite thorough. Um, there was an open competition. Um, I was viewed as one of the only ones who was interested in working with our Indigenous population. Um, I've done a lot of work in health equity uh, and assisting Indigenous populations uh, who are often found themselves uh, victims of discrimination in emergency rooms. And so I'm, I'm very focused on that. Um, I'm currently in the process of making an application to become an adjunct professor at the medical school here at the University of Calgary because I have a specialization in this area. And, you know, it was a thorough vetting process, extremely thorough. Uh, but there was no thorough process to allow me to defend myself or to allow mm -hmm. me. I was just fired. And was that decision, that was the Conservative government's decision, was it yeah. not? Yeah. Well, I and, think it was mostly the Minister of Justice and his staff. And I mm -hmm. would say one of his staff members was not that friendly to me. Mm -hmm. Didn't like me. So, yeah. But I won't go into that right now because... No, uh, that's okay. That's all right. But... I just want to talk a little bit about this this term Islamophobia because of course it doesn't surprise me at all that obviously you writing this book review 13 years ago is not harming the Muslim community in any way shape or form or any Muslim individuals it's obvious that it was just smoke and mirrors and that it was just something that they used to attack you because they knew it would be successful that's the unfortunate part of the story is they knew it would be successful so I was at the House of Commons and I spoke up against M103 years ago, and I talked about exactly this scenario. I said that once you open this door, you are not going to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff. You are not going to be able to tell the difference between somebody who is hating Muslim people because they are bigoted towards Muslims or if this is somebody who is criticizing the religion of Islam or somebody who's just sharing their perspective on the history mm -hmm. <laughs> of Islamic conquests across the globe. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this was something that we could see coming on the horizon. It was very clear. Again, like I said, this term Islamophobia has never been defined um, properly. Everybody defines it however they want to define it. And unfortunately, even the Webster's Dictionary defines it as hate against political Islam, which most Muslims hate political Islam, so that you're just going ahead and called most Muslims Islamophobic. Um, you, you know, the whole country of Egypt is Islamophobic because they had a huge military coup getting their Islam, Islamist president out of power. I, anyway, I could go on. So yeah. it's such a ridiculous term with no proper definition, and it is used whenever it, it wants to be whenever somebody wants to use it because they know it will be successful. Um, it, it's such a such a gray area. And we talked prior to coming on to this discussion with everybody else, we talked a little bit about Wilfrid Laurier University and how the federal government has funded them to write this report, which basically lists out all the Islamophobic groups and Islamophobic individuals, including Muslims, they've even identified some Muslims in their McCarthy list. Um, these are some really scary things that are going on in Canada. Do you feel that telling your story, coming out publicly and sharing what has happened to you, do you think that that's going to 
get Canadian people to start to pay attention, to start to care, to start to be, you know, nervous that their freedom of expression and then that their freedom of speech is, is going to be infringed upon? Or do you think that we're, nobody's going to care until it affects them personally? Sadly, I think it's the latter. Um, I'm hoping that discussing this, talking about it helps. Um, and as uh, you know, as you say, this accusation can easily catch up numerous Muslims. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not something that now I, the list that you're referring to, uh, the professor put together from uh, Laurier University, uh, where she talks about the Islamophobic industry. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they thank the National Council of Canadian Muslims for helping them. With, so, it's, I mean, it, you know, it, it forms a certain web. But, um, you know, I, I, I looked at it and I found there's a number of Benai Brith is on this list. Mm -hmm. You're on this list. Yeah. yeah. Um, the you know, native informant, which is yeah, that a native. derogatory term for them? Like, how are you? Yeah. Yeah. We, they I call us you know, ex-Muslims. Yeah. Yeah, that's not a, the particular. That's that that term itself could certainly be construed as being racist and discriminatory. I would say absolutely. Um, but it 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 is concerning to me. Um, and you know, you mentioned freedom of speech. Uh, one of the things I've kind of focused on is that just academic freedom, because yes. this was a review of a, a purely academic book. I mean, there's no way you can suggest that Professor Car Professor Karsh's book was not an academic book. I mean, you know, light reading it is not. Um, <laughs> when you're discussing the various histories of the various caliphates, and that's that's pretty intense uh, academia. And my review and all my book reviews, some of them appear in peer reviewed uh, journals, some in just average online journals, but they're, you know, at the same, at the, with the same organization, C2C Journal, I had reviewed a book by a critical theorist from New York City um, and talked about Marx and Habermas and all sorts of, uh, and it's, he's, he's from the left and I praised his work and uh, it's, if, if you can't do that, if that turns into a reason to terminate you and to just make ad hominem attacks against you, you know, academic freedom itself is finished. Uh, I don't know how academics can move ahead. And as you say, I was sort of two removes from anything that would be in a sort of hate or speech towards Muslims in Canada. Um, as you mentioned, one of the things that they explicitly tried to link my work to was some recent violent attacks on uh, Black Muslim women wearing hijab in Edmonton. Recently, you know, how could a book review I wrote in 2009, I mean, the causality between those two things is absolutely absurd. There's none. Mm -hmm. But um, that's what it was linked to. Well, of course, my book review had nothing to do with integration of Muslims into Western society with how Muslims are treated. It had nothing, it, that topic wasn't even addressed. I never, I don't think I ever used the word Muslims in the whole book review. And again, as Mr. Karsh, Professor Karsh pointed out, this is his book and my review also were not about the theology of Islam or the religion so much, but about this political element and the political issues that it raises. And of course, what was proof of these of these concerns but Arab, the Arab Spring? You know, mm -hmm. that was this these concerns working themselves out in real time only a few years after I wrote the book review. So to turn it into this, that it happened so easily in a country like Canada um, and, and in a province like Alberta is very concerning to me because I, I, I'm afraid that most people will just ignore it. They won't get worried about it until it does happen to them, until uh, somebody is uh, hit by this. And I'm hoping that there's some change. Um, I'm hoping there's some realization that the term Islamophobia is problematic. And, you know, that term, guys, that came up when I worked at the UN and the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva. That was sort of when the term was becoming uh, used more readily. 
especially in that context, because it was often being used by uh, governments in the Middle East who were being criticized for their human rights record, especially in relation to uh, minorities, women, LGBT. And that's when they started to use this term saying that it was Islamophobic to criticize those governments. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of proliferated from there. And I've seen it happen now. Um, it was, as I said, it, we, you would ha end up with certain governments sitting on, say, for instance, the UN Human Rights Council, um, which were <laughs> problematic to say the least. But, um, and any criticism of that was started, they started to say, well, this is Islamophobic, using that, the phobia element, like there's a fear of Islam, which I've never really had, I mean, I've studied it, I thought, you know, and, and that's also a very discouraging thing is, you know, you come from Alberta, you come from Canada, Canada doesn't have much uh, in the way of academic research on the Middle East and Islam. Uh, there's a few universities that do, but it's not predominant here. Um, so whereas Harvard has a whole department <laughs> of Near yeah. and Middle Eastern Studies, um, and I studied with Musan Mahdi, uh, Farabi especially, um, and Mahdi was the great uh, grandee of uh, Islamic philosophy. You couldn't get a, a more high profile, more respected individual in that field. Uh, he was a wonderful person from Baghdad. Um, originally he taught half the year in Harvard, half the year in Paris, you know, with some of the best thinkers in Paris on these. And of course, also the French have, you know, the, the Institut de Monde Arabe. So they're certainly aware of these issues and trying to deal with them. And I think the sad thing is that you have somebody from Alberta, somebody also from, you know, a group that hasn't had a lot of protections in the Muslim world, going to... To, out of Canada, studying this, learning about it, interacting with Muslims, and then you come back and you're vilified for having done that. Uh, I, th I mean, I think Canada and Alberta need to be a little bit embarrassed for what's going on. Um, and unfortunately, right now, I don't think Canada has yet developed the intellectual framework to think intelligently about uh, these, these issues. And it doesn't really have the historical experience of countries like the UK, Germany, France, uh, for better or worse. I mean, they've had good elements of integration and poor ones. And of course, they have various uh, models. The UK is quite different from France. But Canada just doesn't have those things. We haven't built them up. We haven't thought about them. So we're very easily manipulated by claims uh, that are not justified. And that's my concern in Canada, that we're not able to think intelligently about how to deal with these claims and to to think about how to actually deal with real discrimination against muslims rather than you know an academic study about them or about islam and political islam as i say specifically not even it wasn't a theological discussion it was a political discussion so i'm not that hopeful right now in canada unfortunately and I'm not particularly hopeful that my story will get out there because most journalists have just kind of ignored it now. They don't want to talk about it. So they're scared um, of it. This word yeah. Islamophobia, it just puts fear in everybody. And it's exactly what you said there. It stems from ignorance because in the, just the greater Canadian society, when people see the word Muslim, they think of it as they think of Muslims as an ethnic group. They don't mm -hmm. even understand, they don't even get the difference between different cultural groups that people are from and then this religion, which is a completely separate thing. They, mm -hmm. they think of it as one and the same. So when you're criticizing Islam, you're criticizing Muslim people, and therefore you are a bigot, and they just, they just cannot you know, do the, the, the most basic work that's necessary to not conflate these two things. Um, so yes, I have seen that so much. It's very frustrating. When I was growing up, you know, walk like an Egyptian was really popular. And I thought it was funny. And people would ask me if I, my family lived in pyramids. And there's just like, it, it was okay. You know what I mean? And the fact that uh, when Aladdin came out, people completely didn't understand the Arab world or anything. And 
it was fine because it didn't matter. You know what I mean? It, there was no, no. Um, there was no cost. There was no, it wasn't necessary for them to understand. Mm -hmm. But I think that now it is necessary for them to understand. It is necessary for them to understand, especially when there are people that are using the term Islamophobia, as you were speaking, you're talking about the Iranian government, the Islamic regime in Iran, who is mowing down protesters in the street, killing women who are walking around without a hijab on, raping them to death, beating them to death. And then if you criticize that, you are the bad person. You are the one who is Islamophobic, as if that is it is, it is the most, it, it, it's it's projection in, in the most blatant, disgusting way. Um, and it's gaslighting. You know, it, it would make me so upset when people would, after 9-11, when people would be nervous, they'd want to ask questions about Islam and understand, you know, what would what would bring Muslim people to, to do such terrorism. It's like, then they get called the bad person for even asking these questions. No, they have every right to ask these questions. They have every right to be afraid. You said that you are not Islamophobic. I I feel that you should be Islamophobic. Islam calls for your death. Um, and not mm -hmm. just as a non-Muslim, but as a gay man as well. Islam calls for my death because I'm somebody who has renounced the religion. Mm -hmm. And it is not an irrational fear. It is a very, very rational fear. When I talk about the people in Iran, do you think that they have an irrational fear of the Islamic regime? Absolutely not. It is the most rational possible fear. Um, so the way that they use this term, whenever they want to use it, however they want to use it, that wouldn't work if you were speaking to an educated populace. You know, mm -hmm. people talk about Islam as if it's this little minority religion of these sweet little people that live in the desert. It's the second largest religion on the planet. It is incredibly politically powerful. There, the petrodollars behind pushing these Islamist groups is immense. And we we still do not understand. We still don't don't even know the difference. Like when you were talking about academic freedom, I was reminded of Hamlin University, where a professor shared, again, historical art from Persia that had Muhammad's face painted by a Muslim mm -hmm. that was commissioned by a Muslim sultan, <laughs> you know, and they called that Islamophobic. And then they called for this professor's firing. And the president of the university sent out an email where she said the most egregious thing. She said, the feelings of our Muslim students supersede academic freedom. Mm -hmm. So in the United States of America, when the president of a university can make a statement like that, I mean, I don't understand how everybody isn't up in arms. That is the most anti-American statement um, and there was a, in another university where there was a Muslim professor, an Iranian professor, who shared as well a painting, and it had Muhammad in it, and then they called him Islamophobic. So what's missing here is the nuance. People not understanding Muslims, not understanding that there are so many variations of, it's not a monolith. You've got hundreds of different cultural groups. You've got hundreds of different ways of, of practicing Islam. I mean, we're talking about almost 2 billion people here. Do you think mm -hmm. that they're all practicing in the exact same way? I mean, it's just like Christians. We don't assume that every Christian is, is practicing the same way another Christian is practicing or every Jewish person is practicing the same way another Jewish person is practicing. But they think of Islam as over 50 Muslim majority countries in the world, close to 2 billion people on the planet, we're talking about a quarter of the planet's population. And they think that it's like this big monolith that somebody like the National Council of Canadian Muslims is gonna be able to speak up on their behalf. I mean, it is an absolute joke. And if the people that they were speaking to had even the, the, the tiniest understanding of Islam or Muslims, they wouldn't have been able to get away with the smoke and mirrors bullshit that they did. They wouldn't have been able to call for your they wouldn't have even had the audacity to try, mm -hmm. but they knew that the people that they were gonna be talking to 
We're just going to get afraid of this word Islamophobia the same way journalists are afraid of the word Islamophobia and nobody wants to touch it. And mm -hmm. I will preach for a moment here and tell you that that is exactly why people like me and others who have renounced Islam, this is why we get ignored. This is why our human rights don't matter because we are considered Islamophobic and people in power would rather especially, you know, for the optics, they would rather support fundamentalist extremist Muslims and ext fundamentalist extremist Muslim groups rather than support reform Muslims or ex-Muslims, even though our values more closely align with those of the average Canadians, but because we are the ones that are considered mm -hmm. Islamophobic. So yeah. they are they are viewing Muslims in the same way that the most extremist of Muslims would. And that means that this is the yardstick. And if you are in hijab or in naqab, or if you are praying five times a day or blah, 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 blah all of this, then you are a true Muslim, mm -hmm. you know? But if you are gay or if you're not wearing hijab or if you want to drink alcohol, then you are not a true Muslim and we are not going to listen to you and you don't matter. And especially if you've renounced Islam, then you mm -hmm. are a persona non grata. Yeah. Well, you know, I think what you've said is so uh, on the mark. A couple of things I would point out about that. Um, I studied with Musin Mahdi at Harvard in the 90s. So before 9-11. I knew that Islam and this entire area of the world was central to an understanding of Western politics because one of the first political philosopher who ever really dealt with the intersection between philosophy and a monotheistic religion, the one who really did it was a Muslim, Farabi. He was the first political philosopher. I mean, you have Augustine, you have others in Christianity, but they're more on the theological religious side. I mean, they certainly talked about the political intersection, but Farabi gives a whole, through his works, gives an extensive way of looking at uh, the various subjects that philosophy deals with and how that interacts with revealed religion. So he was, he's fundamental. And that, you know, you'd end up with, there's terms, Latin of Arabists in the Western Christian world. Some who got killed. Cigere de Brabant was a Latin of Arabist and got killed for it. Uh, Dante was most, was similar to Latin of Arabists. Um, that's, that's fun. It was fundamental for me to learn this. And then the other thing about it, I would say, is that both Karsh and Musin Mahdi, who was my professor at Harvard, were fundamentally opposed to Orientalism, which is, that way, just as you described it, looking at Muslims, looking at Islam, looking at the, at the Muslim world through this lens of just its interaction with the West, as though it's reducible to just how it interacted with the West, when Islam has a very storied and profound history of its own and varied across the, the different regions of Islam. And so, of course, Musan Mahdi, one of the great things he did was he did the uh, the the updated version of the, the Thousand and One Nights and took out all the Orientalist editions uh, that were put in by a, a British author and a French author. And that was what he was most famous for. He was very opposed to Orientalism, uh, as is Karsh. Karsh is all about recognizing that Muslims and the Arab world and the Persians and the Turks and Indonesia they all have agency of their own. They're not mm -hmm. simply uh, in their, their, their history and what they do and what they, how they think isn't simply a function of their interaction with the West. Um, and I think that's what's so depressing about this is that when you want to study people and you want to understand them on their terms and, you know, in the book review, what I said, and I wasn't being critical of Islam even, uh, I mentioned, I had this line about Karsh saying that it's you know, one of the most uh, militaristic religions. And the very next line began with, but we have to be careful. Karsh is not criticizing Islam. He's trying to understand it as Muslims understand themselves. Mm -hmm. That was completely ignored in every iteration uh, of uh, story about what had happened. 
And this is what I find so discouraging about this, that ignorance and um, prejudice about what Muslims should be and think and look like has been allowed to turn the, it into a monolith here in Canada. We see Muslims as simply a function of Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so sad because it takes away from the, the rich and varied stories of Muslims across the Muslim world and those uh, in the West. And of course, there's a very history in the West. It's a very different, you know, you have Ismaili Muslims who have a very different approach to some more recent arrivals in the West. So mm -hmm. I think that is what's so sad about this. And, you know, when you mentioned, and I'll just try to, if you don't mind, I'll give you a quick personal story. Yeah. Um, there was an in my partner and I live here in Calgary. We've been together for 10 years. He worked, as I said, for Rachel Knott in the NDP. And he was at church one day, and a woman showed up from Calgary, and she was saying she needed help. And what she needed help with was she was uh from originally from a Middle East country, and I won't say which one, because I don't want this fellow outed. But her son had uh was in one of these countries, he'd been working in another country. In that Middle East country, uh, they had tests, including tests for HIV. Mm -hmm. And he had recently decided that he was gay and he was beginning to have you know, experienced that life. And unfortunately, he uh, became HIV positive. And of course, he found out because of the test that uh, his employer was required to do uh, for him to work in this country as a national from another Middle Eastern country. So he was fired immediately, forced to leave the country, had to go back to his own country. His father was in his home country and his father was all right with this, but, you know, not all right. He's obviously, you know, this is not something anybody wants, news anybody wants. But um, what started happening is uh, there was legitimate fear. His family in that country was beginning to hear that he was gay and uh, had HIV or was HIV positive. So he actually was now facing threats. He was going, they were going to kill him. They were coming to get him. It was like a matter of days. They were coming, his family was going to come and kill him. Not his father, but uncles and cousins and that sort of thing. So his mother, who's here in Calgary, um, came to a church that my, my, my partner went to. And everybody went to him. Is there something you can do? Okay, well, we'll see. And he came to me. I'm a lawyer. So right away, we jumped on. Uh, we got going on this because we knew time was of the essence. This man could be dead uh, for who he was and what had happened to him. And so um, I spoke to another lawyer who's also a well-known New Democrat. She's an immigration lawyer. Uh, we got it set up so he would fly to Calgary through London. And when he arrived, we would make an asylum application on his behalf, which we did. My partner got him set up with End of the Rainbow, which is uh, an organization here in Calgary that helps uh, LGBT Rainbow Railway, yes. Right. They're one of my partners yeah. with my right. organization as well. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. And so, you know, and we didn't get paid for this and we did it, like we had to get it done within days. This was not something where we could take our time. And he was, he was under imminent threat of death, mm -hmm. but we got him out. He's now in Calgary. He lives here as far as I know still. I've never talked to him, I've never met him. I purposely didn't want to get too involved with him because I don't want his story to be, I won't, don't want him identified because he could still, you know, be threatened. And so the sad thing about this though, is my partner at the time also was working, as I said, with Rachel Notley, and he set up a visit for her to go to this organization, to Band of Rainbow, and she met with this individual. And then my partner told her what we had done for him. So to then have these people turn on me and call wow. me Islamophobic and racist when I helped a gay Muslim HIV positive man run for his life. You know, it seems to me that those are the stories that people have to understand. This was an individual who could have died, who was facing death. And it he was not in a particularly stringent <laughs> Muslim country in the Middle East. It was one of the more liberal countries. But his family was still threatening him and would have carried out their threats. So I think, you know, these are the stories that people need to understand. This is not about some sort of, uh, you know, political gotcha 
there's, there's life and death involved here. People die for these things. And, you know, if you're in, when you show an interest in this area, and as I said, I was interested in medieval Islam, both on its own terms and for its impact on, uh, well, of course, Maimonides was a student uh, in, in Judaism as a student of Farabi. Um, and you'd see uh, in, in Aquinas would refer, of course, to the philosopher, which meant Aristotle, and the commentator, which was of Arabs. And Farabi was often called the second philosopher after Aristotle. Um, they had immense respect for these people. So uh, for me, I just followed that. And I think, you know, we can't have a situation going forward where people who are sincerely interested in learning about, as you say, a vast part of the world <laughs> with a lot of differences are simply criticized and taken down in their work uh, because of these claims. So, and am, am, am I Islamophobic? No, I'm not. I'm not, a, I mean, you know, you said I should be afraid. Well, I would, okay. I would not, there's certain, certainly a number of countries in the Middle East I would never go to. Being who I am, I can't. I simply can't. And this happened to my partner um, in his work. He was asked if he wanted to go to Qatar to a ceremony there with his boss. And he said, no, I can't. I can't do that. You, you should know that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm afraid of that. Certainly that I'm not going to, to travel to certain countries um, because I know that it could be dangerous for me. But I think Canada has to really think long and hard about what we want, uh, how we want to interact with this population and stop treating it as just some sort of uh, monolith, as you said, to just be patted on the head and say, oh, well, we're so sorry, you know, you're being treated badly. And, you know, and obviously we can't accept um, uh, violence or, or discrimination against Muslims. But to talk intelligently about the religion and about the politics, which, you know, can certainly harm people, both personally, as I've seen, and politically, we can't do that. That that can't be how we move forward in Canada, because we will not integrate anybody that way. We'll, there will mm -hmm. be no integration. There will be nothing. That will be a failure. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Because a lot of new Canadians that are coming to our country are fleeing these Islamic regimes. So you talked about you would never travel to those countries. And, you know, people like you and I have that choice. We can decide, well, I'm not, I don't want to go to Qatar. I don't want to go to Saudi Arabia. But a lot of people are born and raised in those countries and they are gay or they don't do not want to be Muslim anymore. Or they're a woman who does not want to accept that she needs to wear hijab or that she needs to marry whoever her family wants to force her to marry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and there was a term that was coined by a woman from Iran, Islamotrauma. She says, everybody's talking about Islamophobia all the time, but what about Islamotrauma? So she's somebody who was born and raised uh, under the Islamic regime in Iran. So she couldn't escape. This was her, this is where she's from. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of people, and I've gotten so many messages from people, especially around Ramadan, who have escaped from, name it, Algeria, you know, under, in the 90s, during the, the black mm -hmm. decade, when they were just, Islamists were going around killing anybody who, who didn't follow their rules, including women who didn't wear hijab. People fleeing from Afghanistan, people fleeing from Iran, people, you know, so many different countries. And then they come to Canada and they see that there is such a misunderstanding and there is there's this coddling of what they ran away from. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the, you were talking about the harms that it, that it could cause when Canadians continue down this ignorant route. That is another harm that it can cause is when this woman wrote to me, she had taken her daughter into daycare and she had left, she she had was a refugee from Iran and she was taking her daughter into daycare and they had set up this whole 
Ramadan thing, um, just this Ramadan themed, uh, you know, whatever table. And they had laid out all of these books and they'd laid out a put on and they, and, you know, and she's like, I risked my life to save my daughter because I want her to be secular and I want her to be, you know, not to be indoctrinated and tarnished with any kinds of ideas. And I never imagined that I would bring her to Canada and that I would have to see these kinds of things. She was forced into hijab at seven years old, as every young girl in Iran is if she wants to go to school. And then she sees these books in her daughter's daycare encouraging little girls to wear hijab. I cannot tell you how painful that is. I cannot, it's, it's, it's so, it is such a betrayal. And there are so many shocking stories of Yazidi women in Toronto, in Germany, you know, all around the world, meeting their actual rapists, meeting the men who held them as in, in sexual servitude, meeting those same men who've entered these countries as refugees. It is absolutely essential that the Western world start to understand Islam and Muslims. There, it's not for lack of information out there in the world. It's not for lack of Muslims being very transparent. Um, you can Google the Quran mm -hmm. and Google the Hadith. Like this is, it, it, it feels like, um, you know, after 20 years after 9-11, you know, like it, it, it feels like such a frustration to me that people are still so incredibly ignorant on on the religion and on the people that practice the religion um so yeah I, I completely agree with with everything that you said and i appreciate everything that you said uh it's it's really frustrating for me when you constantly you're talking to people who only see muslims and islam from how they relate to the western world mm -hmm. You know, you know, and I and I sometimes just respond with, yeah, that's right. Arabs were just in the desert making sandcastles, frolicking around until the big bad white man came along and taught us how to be bad. You know, like it, it's 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 the bigotry of low expectations. It's infantilizing. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's condescending. It, it's I I'm I'm so irritated with it. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, one of the things I also encountered was um, people comment, of course, you know, people go on Twitter. Oh, Lord, things people say on Twitter about you uh, without having a clue about you. And there were comments uh, because one of the things, you know, the provincial government here, the UCP government, hadn't really talked about me being the first openly gay chief of the Alberta Human Rights Commission, which in itself should have been something we're Absolutely. saying, hey, this is a big deal. This is never, we've never had this before. This is, shows that mm -hmm. we're not a bunch of knuckle dragging backwards idiots here in Alberta. But uh, after the story came out, after I was uh, fired, my lawyer uh, in, tweeted out that, you know, I was the first openly gay chief of the Human Rights Commission. And the response was, what does that matter? Who cares? And mm -hmm. um, you can still be Islamophobic and be gay. And that was, you know, commentators, academics said that. And I just felt like you just won. You're just, you're making a determination about me. You're making a determination about whether my sexual orientation, my identity actually matters and wiping it out. And, you know, when they did that, as I said, they didn't know that the fellow that I had to meet with from the National Council of Canadian Muslims had himself compared me to an adulterer had compared me to somebody who takes insane amounts of interest or somebody who produces alcohol. That was, these were things he said. And, you know, that, 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 that my orientation, that the being part of an equity seeking group just gets wiped out uh, in the rhetoric and the misunderstanding uh, and the inability to distinguish between various viewpoints of, of Muslims, whether in the West or in, in you know, Muslim majority countries, it, it, was, it was ridiculous. But that was 
the rhetoric I was hearing. Um, and, you know, normally, how could we go down that path? How could we have gotten to that point? I, it's, it's pretty scary that we have. But yeah, that's, that's where uh, what I was hearing. That's what I was being told, that who I was didn't matter. In fact, I was told by staff at the Human Rights Commission that I didn't understand the intersectionality of Black Muslim women. So my being gay didn't mean anything. It was irrelevant. I didn't understand this intersectionality. Um, so, you know, I've spent my a lot of my life, my studies, trying to understand in a way that very, none of these people who were criticizing me exactly. have ever done. I mean, mm -hmm. if if almost everybody who commented about me, if we asked them, I'm sure they wouldn't have ever read at least even one academic work uh, on Islam or its history. Uh, and yet they were able to say what, that I was Islamophobic without any education in the area, without any. Now, the only, but one thing I have to say is when the blog piece first came out about me, and that was July 7th, 2022, that it did quote a professor, a law prof out of Osgood Law School. Oddly enough, <laughs> that law prof um, only two years earlier had himself complained about the IHR def RA definition of anti-Semitism as being mm. um, too broad, that it would prevent criticism of Israel. And yet yes. then two years later, he turns around and is quoted saying that I'm, you know, I've, I'm wrong and I'm Islamophobic. Well, he didn't say it directly, but, you know, that was the intention that I'm Islamophobic. So you and if and of course it was Ben I Brith that called him out for statements he'd made about that definition, where he basically said that you know if you use the definition, especially the connection between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, which is a whole other issue, but it's it's that similar thing. You know, you do have to be careful. Criticism of Israel is legitimate, of its political decisions is legitimate. And yet I I was accused by this professor of doing exactly what he had been accused of two years earlier. Mm -hmm. And it didn't seem to phase him to say what he said. <laughs> so amazing. You know, I, how, I think there's a lot of things that need to be learned here. Um, and, you know, my interactions with Muslims have in included, especially when I lived in Geneva, because there's a very significant Muslim community there, expat community. Uh, included everything from a prince from Saudi Arabia, right down to your average Palestinians uh, working in the Paki, uh, making shawarma. You know, mm -hmm. that it was, and I interact with them on a daily basis, friends, you know, that sort of thing. And so you'd, you'd ask them questions, you'd hear about their different experiences. They, you know, they'd come from Persia, they'd come from Indonesia, they came from uh, Morocco. Um, from Sudan, and you'd get these different uh, stories. And those were fundamental to understanding who these people were. They weren't just their religion. They weren't just Islamophobia. And that's what I think is so sad about what's happened to me, is it reflects that notion that a whole raft of people, as you say, coming up, you know, it'll be 2 billion people not too long, are just a function of how the West treated them. And that's all we see. Yeah. And I mean, I can't think of anything more discriminatory than that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And these are from the people that call themselves the anti-racists. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm going to open it up to the group now and see if anybody has any questions or comments for you. Um, if anybody has anything to say to Colin, please go ahead and just unmute yourself. Nirvan. Hi, I was here because I am from Edmonton. And honestly, what we need is first a bumper sticker saying that Islam is not a race. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, criticizing uh, th theology is very different from, you know, being being a racist. And uh, this reminds me of these uh, trigger happy Hindus in my country, the cow vigilantes, you know. They just want to look for something that should look like beef to kill you. Mm hmm so that is a problem. I mean, we really are not, Muslims are not educated uh, enough to understand the difference between criticizing something and they're just looking for things to get offended for no reason. Mm -hmm. but that, that's my problem. Yeah. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm, honestly, I wish, I mean, if there was some online petition that was there, I, I would happily sign it, you know, 
I would I would ha- happily sign because people are being targeted for no reason. So yeah, mm-hmm. uh, well, and this you. reminds me of uh, the fight uh, that Majid Nawaz had with SPLC, right? He is mm-hmm. he is a Muslim and he had to fight, and I'm glad he won. He got three point four million dollars. I hope you get to. <laughs> well, we'll see what we can do. I mean, I, you know, I'm I'm hoping, given there's a new administration in Alberta here, that they'll see the light. They'll work with me. But you know, I think Nirvana, I think your your comments are are so important, um, and especially the race issue. Now, I, I understand that I can understand why sometimes it's seen as a racialized issue because most Muslims are of a different race from most Europeans. Um, but you know, it, it, the the variety among uh, Muslims in terms of race and just background. You know the, the significant differences. Uh, like you look at look at Turkey, for instance. Um, Ataturk, did, who got rid of the caliphate, the last caliphate, was not a particular fan of Islam. He didn't. He saw it as an error of uh, incrustation on the Turks. He thought the Turks were had this imposed on them in a way. So you know you've got these uh, these vast varieties, uh, and as you say, criticizing Islam should not be seen as racist. Um, it can certainly it can be. I think it's it's also about the sort of anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism. Sometimes being anti-Zionist does have an anti-Semitic element to it. I mean, I'm not a Zionist. I studied I studied quite a bit about that. Uh, one of the philosophers I studied was Leo Strauss, who has a, some people like him, some don't. But he was Jewish and he was not a Zionist. Uh, many people were Jewish and not Zionists. Uh, still are. Uh, Orthodox Jews didn't like the idea of setting up a secular state of Israel because they thought that was contrary to God's will. You know, but you don't you don't necessarily say that um, criticizing something is anti-Semitic or criticizing Israel is anti-Semitic. And just like criticizing elements of Islam or political Islam shouldn't be racialized. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very glad to hear you're in Edmonton. So, ha- you know, happy <laughs> you're in our country, Nirvana. I think that's great. Um, and uh, sure, I, I don't know if there's any petition to get me put back in the job. I don't think there is. I'm not sure I take the job now because of, I mean, it, it's been a very traumatic situation. I've, you know, I'm mm-hmm. not employed right now. I haven't been employed since this happened. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been called a racist and an Islamophobe. Uh, by people, as I said, who probably don't know yeah. one 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 hundredth of what I know about Islam and about its history. But uh, you know, thanks definitely for your comments, and I agree exactly. I think the racialized element, though I can sort of understand where it comes from, I just don't think it helps in these discussions. But I mean, imagine moving from India to Canada to face the same bullshit over here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Anyway, exactly. all the best to you, and thank you, uh, uh, Yasmin, for for making this happen. Uh, there are others who want to ask. Sure. Yes. Philip, you're next. I, um, thank you, um, Colin, and thank you, Yasmin, too. I very much enjoyed the book. Um, I'm a psychiatrist by background, as I said in the chat, and you're quite right. The word Islamophobia is really a nonsense made-up word. Phobia is a genuine condition which consists, consists of three elements. The first is markedly excessive fear to a situation leading to market a market degree of avoidance which has a significant negative impact upon the pe- person's quality of life it's a real condition it needs treatment but to apply the word phobia after after another word is islam or dare I say even trans is absolutely nonsense it's meaningless but what it does do it's this invented word actually is brilliantly used to close down discussion. It contaminates the possibility of debate. And as Orwell said, and I mentioned him, I'm a great fan of Orwell. Um, he pointed out how if if uh, thought can corrupt language, language can corrupt thought. So once that term is out there, there's a bit like the kind of Overton window of what is acceptable in terms of the debate. And I would personally agree Say Orwell fan, I would see myself as of the left, but the left has catastrophically abandoned Muslim women throughout the planet. I think uh, Sue Lloyd Roberts, who is a uh, sadly died of breast cancer, was a BBC journalist who was very strong in this. She referred 
as a woman of the left, Saudi Arabia was the largest open prison in the world. She did point out, quite interesting, that clitoridectomy wasn't that common in France, but was in Britain. And why is that? Because in France, she said, this was 10 years ago, there were quite a few people in jail because of it, quite rightly so, <laughs> for facilitating it. But there is a bit of the uh, left or those who think they are progressive, that you're not allowed to criticise any element of Islam. Thus the nonsense of Yasmin or the wonderful Masia Lenajad being labelled as Islamophobic. Um, and, and that's a problem. So I think it's very important we always use words in the correct way because if somebody can set the terms of the debate, can set the terminology, that really dramatically influences the course of the debate. So finally, uh, keep on doing what you're doing, both of you. It is important to stand up for democracy. I'm from Northern Ireland where we know all about identity mm. politics rather than genuine left-right politics. I'm from a Catholic background, but I object the term of I'm not part of a Catholic community, which includes members of the IRA who kill the people. Uh, people from mm -hmm. a Protestant background in Northern Ireland, many never identified the poisonous bigotry of Ian Paisley. You know, but there is this kind of simplistic way of looking at things. So both of you keep on the work that you're doing and thank you. Okay. Well, you know, uh, Philip, I think one of the things you've really hit on there is that there has become uh, the left tends to be more sympathetic to these claims of Islamophobia, or you say transphobia. And, you know, I, I won't get into too much into that. I mean, even as a gay man, you know, the homophobia, sometimes I don't mind the word. Sometimes I'm, I get a little cautious because I think it, yeah. it probably goes beyond what it should yeah. really mean. But, you know, uh, I've certainly worked with the trans community to help uh to promote their their rights um but the left issue i think is very interesting because this is something i've written another book review about i mentioned this fellow from new york city who's a critical theorist uh part of the tradition of habermas and benjamin and that and adorno and horkheimer and um you know there's a recent book more of an essay it's pretty short i would suggest everybody should read it uh by susan neiman who's a moral philosopher uh she's primarily a kantian uh, out of Potsdam, Germany, uh, and she has written this short book about the left not being, it, the left is not woke, um, and she makes this argument, and I've heard this from a number of Marxists as well, that the problem with uh, how, where the left is going now is it's going into a tribal mentality uh, rather than the universalist mentality, which was always sort of the hallmark of the left in the past. Yeah. You know, uh, Kantian universalism, or even Marx. Well, Marx has the battle of the proletariat versus the the you know the owners, but it is with towards a universalist goal. But so much of what has happened now with our where liberalism is at now on the left, it's it's embraced a tribalism uh, through intersectionality theory that is uh, becoming, I think, very harmful. Um, and I one Marxist referred to it as late liberal bourgeois decadence, as Marxists, so, <laughs> Marxists have great fit phrases sometimes. And so I think that's a key thing that we have to remember, that there are, even in the, the philosophical realm, the cultural realm, voices on the left, like Susan Neiman's, who are just not willing to go along with this and see the damage it's causing. So I think you're absolutely right to call that out on the left as well. And I think a lot of us identified with the left and felt that we were a part of the left until we realized that the left did not want any part of us. Sahara. Hi guys, good afternoon. Hi Yasmin, hi Colin, hi everyone. Sorry, I almost missed the podcast because I thought it was afternoon somehow, but here I am, I made a half. I have to listen the other half. Thank you, Colin, for coming and sharing your story and, you know, talking about this nonsense. Uh, I, I don't even know how to. <laughs> it makes me really sad. It makes me angry at this Islamophobia word. Um, you know, I was called this word and labeled when I was still in the religion, when I was in the cult. I say when I was blindly still following and believing Islam and I was still wearing the hijab 
when I heard the first time Islamophobia, I was I was being, or I am Islamophobia and I need to stop asking questions. That's what I was told. So this word is nonsense. It's a BS and I can't stand it. And, and it's being used, it, it literally being used to be, to be silent, any individuals who says anything negative about Islam or just question it or just being critical about something, they don't want you to talk about it. They just don't want you to ask questions. And I think there's also agenda behind on the reason they, of course, created this word. So if you don't touch the religion, if you don't want to criticize what, you know, uh, Muslims are doing to each other, like, you know, behind the scene, mutilating their own children, uh, child marriage and, you know, um, forced, forced marriage to their children, you can't talk about now that, you know, that bad practice because you're Islamophobia if you talk about it. And I think they are doing this because, um, you know, they, they just don't want you to talk about it. And, and I think we need to talk about this, but it just makes me really mad and angry. And I just find it really, really funny and ridiculous. The word is just so funny calling me Islamophobia. Islam is not a race. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, I don't know who said earlier, like we need to have a stick, you know, a uh, bump sticker, like somehow um, teaching 101, you know, class 101 about Islam and about Momo. We, we need to do that. You know, we're going to teach about a class about how Islam is not a race. And it's just an ideology. It's a set of ideas and it doesn't have a feeling. And Muslims have to get over that. And they need to learn their religion is going to be criticized, especially if you're living in the Western world. You came to here and you came for a better life. You came for a freedom, freedom of religion. Why are you silenting people to talk about these horrible, barbaric practice within your own community? Code, code, again, community. I don't believe community, but, you know, so, I mean, Thank you, Colin, and I'm sorry you've been labeled that word, and I just find it very funny, and it's ridiculous, and it's BS, and and about the left, I think you said something about, about they being some uh, sympathetic or something, no, I don't know, you said they, they care about, mm -hmm. yeah, you, they, they care about um, people, or, and I think earlier you made a comment about how you were told um, you know, you make it hard for black Muslim women. I was laughing, literally. I wanted to unmute my mic. I mean, these people have no idea what goes behind the scene. They don't care about anybody. I migrated here. I came to America when I was illiterate. I'm a survivor of FGM. I wanted to tell my story, but then the left to tell me, no, we don't want that. We don't want, we're not interested in that story. We want you to be a victim. We want you to to use this victimization that the West is racist and this all nonsense. And no, the West hasn't done anything to me. The people who hurt me the most are my freaking people that you're trying to protect. You know, you're protecting our abusers and this needs to stop. And I think we need to keep speaking and it just, we just continue to speak. And Yasmin and I, and Ali is not here, but you know, we have a Twitter space or spaces where we talk about silent voices in Islam. They are real silent voices. Islam exists. We exist. We're going to talk. We're going to have a conversation. I mean, I can't even, all the names in the book we've been have been labeled. I, I'm not really scared. Label me these nonsense. I call them buzzing words, but we need to have a conversation and people need to be honest. And I think sadly, Muslim are not being honest. They're not trying to at least try to acknowledge perhaps there's something wrong. Maybe you are blind on on a side of your religion or the culture that you're protecting. There's things that we need to talk about it and we need to be honest. But I wanted to say thank you. Good for you. And welcome to the Islamophobia Club and no, no to Momo. <laughs> thank you. I, I just want to give you a little bit of background, Colin, before you respond to Sahara. Um, she is a Somali refugee. Um, as she mentioned, she was a, a, she is a victim of FGM. And when she tried to speak up in America about FGM and speaking up for the girls that have been mutilated, she was silenced and told that she was Islamophobic. So we've talked about how that word is a bludgeon to silence people, and it is, but it's also a word 
that perpetuates continued victimhood because it protects the, the oppressors by silencing people from criticizing things that very direly need to be criticized, then we're just allowing those atrocities to continue. So sorry, go ahead and respond to this, Sahara. No, sure. I think I think that's that's a really unfortunate element of this. And you know what is what goes through my mind, and one of the things that went through my mind about this is, as I mentioned, you know, I I studied uh, medieval Islamic philosophy, and of course, that's it existed in a period sometimes referred to as the golden age of Islam. Yeah. Uh, from about the eighth, sometimes the twelfth century, sometimes it goes as far as the fourteenth. Uh, but it was a period when it was actually very plausible. Now, it was dangerous. You had to be careful how you did it sometimes. But you had these active intellects. Uh, and Farabi, of course, learned his philosophy from Nestorian Christians, who also were not considered orthodox in their religion at the time. You know, because there, there's, there's quite a variety of, of Christianities as well. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, we tend to think there's Catholics and Protestants and that's it. No, there's a lot of other ones too who have very different. And But in Christianity, of course, most of the disputes occur on a very kind of academic level about the Trinity and the nature of the Trinity and Christ's nature, whereas Islam doesn't, you know, is, mono, is pure monotheism in that sense. So, But one of the things that was amazing about studying this period is how these philosophers would introduce foreign concepts, concepts that conflict specifically with teachings of Islam that came out of Aristotle. Um, they're kind of esoteric, I won't get into them, but they were allowed to, to study this, to read it, to think about it. And as I said, they were taught, Farabi was taught by historian Christians. Um, a few centuries later, you'd have uh, Cordova, you had uh, where you had Christians, Jews, Muslims interacting with each other, arguing with each other. Um, Christians would argue with Muslims on the basis of their uh, of philosophy, and and they'd often argue with Jews about whether their religion was which religion was correct on the basis of reading uh, the Bible. Well, so you'd have these spaces where people would talk. And mm -hmm. I mean, this is a tradition in Islam. It's not something mm -hmm. that should be suppressed. This mm -hmm. should be remembered and celebrated as an achievement. Uh, and I think that's, and not calling people names. I mean, you didn't have Aquinas calling Avicenna names because he maybe disagreed with him on something. Um, you know, of course, they were in different centuries, but, uh, you know, in their writings, Aquinas would praise them, Dante would praise them. You'd have that praise of these people uh, and what they represented. Uh, so I think Sarah is exactly right. We can't have this approach of denigrating people who are engaging in what is an, is an Islamic tradition, not just a Western tradition, uh, but comes out of a period of when Islam was powerful, when it was producing a lot of civilizational achievements. And I, I mean, it's sad because it's being shut down. That's all being shut down in the name of a sort of victimhood under Islamophobia. And I think that's just, it's, and you know, like you have people like Nirvana who are in Edmonton. Well, how is he going to contribute to enriching Canada if that history that's part of his history can't be talked about? It, you know, we can't talk about the good and the bad. How does that, you don't have an enrichment of our country from people like that if they can't talk about their own, their lives, like Sahara couldn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Can I say one more thing? Uh, and this might feel offensive, but I, I say Muslim are allergic to their own shit, but they like to talk other people's shit. So Muslims need to acknowledge their own shit and crap. Yes, talk about the negative and the goods, but they will talk about the goods, but they are allergic to to the bad shit crap, you know? But um, but also one thing I wanna say, Yasmin, if you allow me, is the left, you know, there is similarity. And that's the reason on the left, I said, no, you're not gonna use me as a puppet, even though I migrated here and I was told I was part of, part of the left, which I didn't wanna be any part. I just wanna be left alone. And, you know, I love freedom and I love the country I'm in, which is in the United States and just leave me alone. But the left told me that I have to be on the left because I migrated here. 
But then when I questioned, I was told, no, I was being radical Republican. So these people, the similarity with Islam and the left, what I see is you can't dissent. They don't like dissenting mm-hmm. voices. Islam does not like dissenting voices. If you question, they don't like that. Just the left does the same thing. And it's just scary. And people need to just question things. And if I can't question something, if you're going to call me, uh, um, what is it, like uh, phobia, like transphobia, I can't question things. That's a cult. We need to be, you question my ideas too. We should talk about it. We should have a conversation. So thank you. Yeah. I do want to point out, though, as as Nirvan mentioned, Majid Nawaz, there's um, lots of, you know, there's Astra Nomani, there's uh, Zuri Jasser, you know, I could go on and on. There's lots of um, Muslim reformers, Rahil Raza, Tariq Fatah, people who are named as Islamophobic uh, bigots in this document from Wilfrid Laurier. But there are a lot of brave Muslims in the West that are trying to speak up, um, but they are attacked just as much as anybody else is. And sometimes even more because the the, the extremists in the Muslim community really see them as a threat because they are within Islam as opposed to people like us who they can just dismiss as non-Muslims. so you're right that right now there's just extremism on all ends, extremism on the left, the right, the Muslim community, extremists everywhere. It's just an unfortunate time in history where we are right now. But something that, you know, I'm part of this group called the Clarity Coalition. It's, it's the Champions for Liberty Against the Rise of Islamist Tyranny. And I work with Muslims there atheists, Jewish people, Christian people, Hindu, you know, all sorts of different people. It doesn't matter what their identity is. Nobody's really interested in that. We're interested in each other's ideas. And it is really heartening to see that the West is still, it's as much as we criticize a lot, we've spent a lot of time criticizing the West here. It's allowing these Muslims a space to be able to have these conversations and to to dissent and to to express their dissenting opinions. And you can actually see that happening uh, in Twitter right now. There is a a long list, over 200 Muslim organizations um, released this document called Navigating Differences, which is just this just shockingly homophobic document talking about how there's no such thing as gay Muslims and how what the Quran says about uh, gay people. And, and, and it, it's just really atrocious. But you're finding that Muslims are speaking up against the writers of that document and the people who have signed that document. So it is kind of this, it, that whole thing right now of what you were talking about, Colin, of just having discourse, having I don't know if it's productive or if it's respectful, but there's discourse anyway. Um, So I I can sort of see that happening now within the Muslim community, which you could not do before. If you so much as spoke, you know, a whisper different from what was ideologically demanded of you, then you were putting your life in danger. So, um, I'm I'm hesitant. I mean, I, I've always been a hopeless optimist. I think that's why I'm still alive today, honestly. But I'm I'm kind of hesitant. But I I do I think I I do see a difference in the Muslim community, at least in the West, um, because of free speech and free expression, and we're allowed to express our our, our differing opinions and. You know, like there's these movies that come out, like the Shia made a movie for about Fatima and the Sunnis didn't like it. And so they were protesting to get the movie taken down. And just that alone, just people seeing Muslims protesting against other Muslims because of this movie and they disagree with the ideas that are in it. That is going to be enough for people in the West to start to see, ah, so they're not a monolith after all. There are dissenting opinions and um, I think that that can only be a positive thing, that kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We usually use the word when we're talking about technology, disruption. 
I like that disruption that I'm seeing in, in the Islamic community now. Yeah. If the community exists at all, I don't think there's any such thing. I agree with Sahara. There's no such thing as an ummah. Um, we all talk about it as if it exists, but it, it doesn't exist. Can I add just one more thing, Yasmin, if you don't mind? Mm -hmm. uh, also, the fact that uh, someone's sexual orientation was discussed so many times, even in this podcast, yeah, is something that makes me uncomfortable. And what I'm worried about Canada is that a gay man has to constantly say that again, openly and whatever. And, 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 and conversely, there will be a male who is identifying as a female wanting a Brazilian wax in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. So, you know what I'm saying? I mean, the priorities are, yeah. I mean, it's, it's bewildering, you know, the inversion of priorities that the Canadian government, you know, I mean, there, there are people who actually won uh, cases, you know, who just identify themselves as, as women. But there mm -hmm. is this, this a gay man who has to keep on constantly discussing his orientation, which is not a right thing, you know. That is also something that needs to get out of the system. Is about I feel. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, yeah, I, I agree, Nirvan, because um, you know, I've I've been gay for fifty two years. <laughs> you know, it hasn't ever, and I've lived in um, Canada. I've lived in Boston. I've lived in Geneva. I've lived in Paris, uh, Halifax, Ottawa, and in, here in Calgary, and uh, Edmonton too. Um, and I've never had to talk about it this much it's it's becoming something that i now almost have to defend again um and i've actually had some experiences in the last few years that have forced me to have to defend my being gay being this in in a in a, an atmosphere where you think that's over with we we're past that but in fact i've actually had to bring it up more in the last couple of years and defend it in scenarios, including a scenario, I'm not gonna say the organization because I respect the organization. And it, you know, again, this wasn't necessarily intended, but I had an experience where I was uh, on the board of an organization. They were talking, they had an anti-racism and anti-discrimination committee. And the uh, they put out the report and they defined discrimination. And it talked about age discrimination and racial discrimination and religion and family status and all sexual orientation, gender expression, all that was gone. There was nothing about that in the definition. And I had to say, wait a minute, guys, you can't have a definition of discriminate definition of discrimination that completely wipes that out as part of your uh, anti-racism position. And so it, you know, it, it's been surprising to me that I have lived my whole life uh, in these various parts of the world, uh, have never really experienced any sort of homophobia or discrimination because of who I am. And yet in the last few years, I'm now obligated to talk more about it, to try to stand up for myself in a way that I thought, wait, we're supposed to be moving forward, and I don't think we are. And that does concern me. So, so I think you're absolutely, Nirvana, I think you're right on the money there. Why are, are, are we doing this now? Why am I in this position? Um, I think it, you know, it should have just been, okay, there should have been an announcement. I was appointed. The government could have said I'm the first openly gay chief of the Human Rights Commission, and we're done. But now it's turned into me having to actually justify my own experience uh, and and my own identity, uh, which you know, I'm like you. I'm. I don't think. Uh, and you know, I. I mean, I'm not hostile to anybody from a religious tradition who has concerns about homosexuality or concerns about uh, transgender or anything like that, because you know, for years, even Barack Obama was opposed to, to same sex marriage until suddenly he wasn't. You know, um, people have learned these things. This is what they've lived in. This is the culture they've lived in. I'm not offended that, you know, many Muslims consider homosexuality to be haram, but that can't be something that's then turned against me or mm -hmm. used against me. I mean, I, I, I understand people have these experiences and that's fine. They're human beings. We all have views that we, we learn or, uh, and we uphold and that's, you know, that's, that's perfectly normal. 
But um, especially given the role I was in as chief of the Alberta Human Rights Commission, and what I, I go back to, what's so sad about my removal is I would bet you that there probably weren't 10 people in this province who would have known as much about Islam, its history, its philosophy, and could intersect that with the 2S LGBTQ plus community or my work in Indigenous health equity or for seniors in health equity. I mean, I, I think what health. I brought to the table was a possibility of a really good dialogue. And instead, that's now been wiped out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lena, Liam, David, I just want to make sure that any of you have an opportunity to speak if you want to say anything to Colin before we wrap up. You're good? I, I just had one thing, though. Just last one thing. Like, like Sam Harris said, you know, your capacity to be offended is not something that I need or should respect in you. Mm -hmm. So, Hi. Colin, uh, oh, oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, Lena. <laughs> yeah, I just want to um, to thank you all. Uh, thank you, Colin, for uh, sharing your story here. I um, I live in Alberta, and I did hear about your story mm -hmm. in the on the radio and the local news. But of course, very briefly, I had no clue about any details. So I do appreciate listening to your side of the story, which I know we will never hear in the mainstream media. So I do appreciate that. And uh, thank you for uh, for sharing this. And thank you, yes Yasmin, for giving people this opportunity to, to, um, to uh, yeah, to share their stories. And uh, it's, it's really concerning to me, the fact that you lost your job without giving the opportunity to explaining your perspective or um, telling your, your side of the story or justifying um, your action or even <laughs> defending yourself. This is really disturbing to me because um, I've lived half of my life so far in Canada. Um, I made a decision in my early 20s to leave my my own country and move continents across the ocean and come here to Canada to start a new life. And of course, I had many reasons, but in my opinion, the most important one was freedom of speech. So it's really concerning to me to live to this day, to see with my own eyes that Freedom of speech is not a value that Canada defends anymore. Um, and uh, I do appreciate all people who are doing everything they can to, to maintain this value, the freedom of speech. And uh, yeah, so that that's all I have to say. So thank you so much. I, I really... Like this episode was very important to me. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, for letting me know and for being here in Alberta. Um, all right, Colin, I think we're going to wrap it up now. I just sure. want to give you the last word. If there's anything that uh, you wanted to express or share with us before, uh, before we conclude. Well, again, I just thank you uh, for doing this. Um, I think for me, what I want to express is um, to Canadians is don't don't judge Muslims or Islam or uh, Islam as a religion or the political system of Muslim majority countries by Canadian multiculturalism standards. Mm -hmm. uh, learn about them. Learn about the variation, the differences, um, and respect these people as people. You know, there. This is it, there is an interesting story to be told here. There's a very interesting history to Islam, um, and what? Why does it diverge? Why did you know? Why is there Islam? Why did? Why? What were the issues in Arabia? Uh, you know, amongst the Jews and the Christians that, uh, that the Prophet was interacting with. Why? Why is this religion here? You know, 
think about these things, engage with it. Um, but we can't do that if we're being called uh, Islamophobic because we've done that. Um, and so, you know, hopefully um, we'll see some change. Um, as I said, I'm a little bit pessimistic right now. Um, but I think down the road, and of course, you know, it becomes problematic because uh, politicians will are looking for votes. The Muslim community mm -hmm. is growing. And if they can get mm -hmm. those votes by going to just one organization and getting their approval, they will do that. Um, but that leaves so many in a very diverse group community. If you, you know, I mean, it's as I say, it is difficult to use the word community with Muslims because there is so much difference across the board um, and uh, so much variety, so much that's interesting. So I think, yeah, we need to, to learn. We can't hide and uh, in ignorance. And I think for Canadians to just sort of view Muslims as this, as we've said, a monolithic group, um, uh, as one of the intersectionalities that we're looking at, <laughs> It is pretty sad. It's it's going to leave uh, leave us in a pretty uh, depressing place, and it's going to harm more people. More people will Absolutely. encounter what I've encountered, uh, and we also have we have an obligation in a certain respect, I think, to hold those governments to account in the Middle East that allow uh, an HIV positive gay Muslim man to be threatened by his own family, to be threatened with death such that he needs people in another country to rescue him, to help him get away. Um, that has, there has been a count for that. We can't ignore that. Um, I mean, what are human rights if we don't do that? What was my job about if I, if I didn't do that? Um, so that's, I guess, my, my statement on that. And I love we'll it. see where it goes. Love so every single much. word of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. It was an absolute pleasure. And like Nirvan said, we are hoping for you three million and even more <laughs> <laughs> in your well, in your. Uh, if I can get some of it, I would like to see some of it go towards you know increasing maybe Awareness. a scholarship to go study Farabi. You know, I I yeah. want I want that to be I want the universal ideas, the historic, the great historical moments to be remembered and to come down to us and not be forgotten. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Colin. You're such a wonderful human being. And I'm really, really glad that we got to spend these couple of hours together. And uh, thank you so much for joining us and being so honest and, and for sharing your, your difficult story with us. And thank you everyone for joining me here today. And uh, I look forward to seeing you at the next podcast. Take care, Thank everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.